This wise old whiskery fish swims up to three young fish and goes, Morning, boys, how's the water? And swims away. And the three young fish watch him swim away and look at each other and go, What the fuck is water? And swim away. Neil, how are you doing this fine afternoon? I'm doing good. My head has exploded from this book, but other than that, it's yeah. good. <laughs> Not unlike Jim's head. Yeah. <laughs> which also exploded. Yep. That's why I was saving that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so if you can't tell from your podcast player, the book today that we're covering is Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace. I think it should go without saying that since this is a fiction book, there will be spoilers. Uh, I don't know that I would say that you like shouldn't listen to this if you haven't read it, though, because I assume most people who would listen to the podcast haven't read it. And I don't know how much we'll actually spoil because I don't know. I, th- I think people will understand. It's not like there's really anything to spoil. Like there's no like nothing really big, surprising things happen that I can think of that we would give away. Like it's it's not a normal book. No, it's not a normal book. <laughs> That's the understatement of the day. Uh, it's not a normal book. But yeah, it's, I, I was going to completely agree with you uh, there that like the central plot is not really what the book is about. And that sounds weird. Yeah, the plot doesn't really matter very much. Yeah. <laughs> like, and you could almost even argue that there isn't even really that much of a plot, right? Like, yeah, it's not really read for the story. I'm sure we're going to like, piss off some David Foster Wallace scholars by saying this, but that, I mean, that was the gist I got by the end of it. I don't know if that was the feeling you had as well. Same. Uh, Yeah. No, no, no. Same. And I guess maybe we should just say, I guess all the opinions here are just ours. There are probably a million interpretations or different ways that uh, maybe people who've studied David Foster Wallace a lot more closely than we have uh, probably have different, perhaps better opinions, but these are just our opinions from one reading of the book. Cause apparently people, this is a, I guess a book that uh, I think he intended this too um, to be reread, and perhaps you get different interpretations on different readings. So yeah, this is we've only read this book once. It's even self-referential in that yeah. sense. Yep. It, kind of like uh, Go to Lesher Bach, where you get to the end and it intends for you to go back to the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Well, like the first chapter occurs after the last chapter, I think, right? Yeah, so there's 28 chapters, and most of them take place across about 10 years. Yep. And then the first chapter takes place in the last year, in the 10th year. And then the last chapter takes place, or the last chapter ends a year before that. And then there's a whole year that is just not covered at all in any part of the book. Yeah. And if you're already not, if you're already confused, congratulations. That's the purpose. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and that year where not where uh, that year that's not covered in the book is where all of the most exciting parts of the book that you think are going to happen happen. You get no resolution or anything really from it. It just sort of ends and it's up to you to decide what might be in the gaps that he leaves you with at the end of it. Yep. Yeah, and going back to one thing you said like a minute ago about there's not really a central plot or there is, you know, there might be a plot but it's not really that relevant. I had written down a quote that I think DFW David Foster Wallace said in an interview, which is, uh, fiction is about what it's like to be a fucking human being. <laughs> I, I kind of like that in the sense that yeah. for, for this book, especially in that the narrative or the central plot of like someone's life is really just a narrative fallacy at the end of the day, right? Like it's a story that you tell yourself, but there's probably a million other stories. Like there's a million different ways to see that story and you know, someone else looking at it would probably tell the story differently than you would tell your own story. It's kind of interesting. It's like, there's not necessarily a central plot. Like there is a plot to the book. Like there's a a way that events kind of transpire, but there's also uh, not to what you said, right? I mean, it's not really that important. Yeah. It's like about, I mean, you can't really put what it's about in a sentence, but it's like the sense I got is it's, it's almost like life in a weird way. Like the variety of, of experiences and lack of true plot, right? Like the, your, anybody's life doesn't have a, oh, first this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Any attempt to do like to tell it that way is you uh, putting a narrative on top of events that happened. But like things are extremely complex, obviously, and probably in this book as well. Yeah. And but it's even because like that's a common way of describing 
good literature versus you know less good books is whether they're plot driven or mm. character driven yeah and movies and movies yeah good point um and usually when you talk about something being character driven it's because the characters go through some sort of evolution or experience or personal growth but even that doesn't really happen here because none of the characters change throughout the novel like nobody like undergoes any big transformation for the most part like gately might be the only one the one who was in the rehab uh or the drug halfway house kind of thing yeah i think he'd, he'd be the one and then maybe some of hal's stuff towards the end but yep you know joel or in anybody else at the tennis academy like pretty much everybody just stays the same and it it, it kind of goes back to this recurrent theme throughout the novel and also throughout the writing of chaotic stasis right where it's this like constant feeling of everything being stuck but also in chaos and that's kind of how the book ends too because yeah. the book ends like right before all of this crazy stuff is going to happen but nothing has happened yet <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then, right and, and then you like have to go back and look at the first chapter again and it's picking up a year after the crazy stuff has happened and you're just like how did we get here so yeah and and they they make statements that kind of like let you imply or uh infer i guess what happened in that time but not with perfect clarity at all like yeah. it's not like when you go back to the first chapter you can say, oh, yeah, well, absolutely, this is what happened after the, you know, in that in-between time. Uh, there's just hints thrown in there. Uh, I mean, I'm sure we're going to talk about this. I guess this is as good of a time to bring it up as any. I think he, I strongly think, and um, it's not only my opinion, I think we got this partially from some of the blog posts that we read afterwards, <laughs> but he intended the book to be an active work of fiction as opposed to just something yeah. you sit back and read. So, uh and I mean, that has a lot to do with his overall philosophy, which we can we can kind of get into. Yeah, I think that's where the challenge of the book makes sense, because it's it's one of those books like Ulysses or, you know, Finnegan's Wake or whatnot, where it's kind of like, I guess, a, a badge of honor in very nerdy circles to have finished it. <laughs> I was going to say not in most circles. <laughs> yeah, not in most circles. Right. But it, it is one of those things where it's like, oh, wow, you like made it through that book regardless of how much you actually got right it's it's written to be hard like he's trying to make it work to get through it i think pretty explicitly yeah with all the footnotes especially oh and... yeah we should we should talk about the footnotes quickly oh there's like 300 pages of footnotes <laughs> yeah yeah so and this is the crazy no no, no not footnotes though end notes end notes yes yeah, sorry not footnotes yes you read it on a kindle right yeah, so I read it on a Kindle, and I found out later that uh, well, and also the version on Kindle. Correct me if if you had a different version, but the version that I had, it was not that easy to get to the end notes. Oh, it was super, it was really easy on mine. That's what I was going to say. Is like if you're going to read it, read it on Kindle because there's over 350 end notes. Many of them contain essential information to the plot. Yep. <laughs> so you can't skip them, and. You have to keep flipping back and forth between where you are at the end of the book. But if you're on Kindle, you can just like tap a button and go to the end note and then hit back. And that is definitely a lifesaver. I can't imagine the nuisance of having to flip a 1200 page book back and forth yeah. when he references an end note every couple pages. Which is what he like. There was no Kindle when he wrote the book. So the funny thing is like yeah. he fully intended you, which is like a dick thing to do. But it's what he really, I mean, it's, it's really what he wanted, this active act of reading, basically, where you yeah. flip back and forth. And yeah, it's like he fully intended you to be flipping. I was going to say the version I had, and I don't know if it's the version I had or the fact that I'm using the Kindle app on my iPad, which I just have not updated iOS for a long time. Um, so maybe things are not, some things are not rendering properly, but most of the end notes I could just click and go. But then I would say about 25% of them I had to flip, you know, like go and, and manually get to them. Oh, uh, the longer ones. Yeah. yeah, it's still the I mean, it's still Kindle. So it's not as hard as the physical copy. I don't know what I'm complaining about. But, but yeah, it wasn't as simple as just clicking, which got annoying for the, most books. It doesn't matter. But for this one, obviously, as you said, you can't just skip the end notes because there's like essential information that's in there. Yeah. I mean, for one example, the the 10 years that the book takes place in is it's what 2000 to 2010 i think something like are, that are yeah. the years 
but they've stopped using numbers for years. <laughs> so the government passed a thing called subsidized time where every year gets sponsored by a different company. So there's like year of the Whopper and year of Glad and year of the what Tux medicated pad. And the Depend undergarment. Yeah, the Depend adult undergarment, right? So they use those names instead of years. And you have no idea what order those are in when you start the book. Yep. <laughs> and those are the only ways he refers to dates. And then you don't find out the order until a end note about 300 pages in, I want to say. <laughs> no, it's page 223. It's like a, a famous page number for the book. It's like on page 223, there's an end note that takes you to the back of the book where somebody lists out the order of the subsidized time years and then you would have to go back for the first 200 pages and figure out what order everything happened in because the book like starts off jumping around insanely between different years it gets more stable as it goes on but yeah you just have no idea what order anything is happening in for you know the length of a normal book yeah <laughs> it's <laughs> it's absolutely crazy it's it's wild i mean it gives you a good sense too of the chaos which you're immediately kind of thrown into yeah just because like there's not even dates to anchor yourself on. <laughs> That's not even there. So yeah, you're you're thrown into nothing, like true chaos. Yeah, it, there's another thing. So one of the central parts of the book that we'll talk about a lot is the one of the characters who's deceased for the entire novel, but is referenced constantly, created a movie that was so entertaining that people would watch it nonstop until they died. And the, the movie's called Infinite Jest. Yep. And... The only way you initially figure out that this person created it and a lot of essential information around it is that this person's like, what is it called? Filmography is referenced at some point. And then you have to like go to an end note and read like four or five pages of all these made up movies and like made up people who starred in them in different years and whatnot. And then like towards the end, you see that he created like these infinite jest movies. And it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> it's everything is really buried and that's pretty far into the book too it's like halfway or so i think yeah well and it's it's a constant thing throughout the book too where you'll have you know like we were saying there's very little action right it's mostly about the characters and so you'll get into these chapters or these sections where you read you know 10 pages of you know just descriptions about kids playing tennis and then something like really important happens at the end of it within like two sentences yeah and so you kind of want to check out at times because you're just like oh my gosh this part is really boring but you know there might be something crucially important that gets snuck in there so or there's just and i wish i had a great one to point to but there are random passages as you said they'll happen kind of when nothing you know is really occurring but random passages that are just beautiful or like essays you know what i mean there th that he'll have like effectively a non-fiction essay just like sitting in a random part of the book and it has to do with what's going on in the book of course but it, it, you can't necessarily just tune out uh you're like oh okay this page is not really anything important and then just skip to the next page because you you might miss something really nice it, it, it's a it's such a weird book to even talk about right because as we're talking <laughs> yeah. about this it almost sounds like a dream that we had or something. <laughs> a little bit. You know, it's very dreamlike. There are important things in the book that do happen during dreams. The, the book is also very lightly supernatural. Yeah. There's a wraith, you know, like a ghost, basically, that is influencing stuff through large portions of the book. Yep. There's a guy who can levitate, but that's like very, very subtly mentioned only yeah. once or twice. There's just like little things like that where you're like, wait, what? It took me a while to realize that part of it. Yeah, the levitating part? No. Or the ghost? Even the ghost. Like I was at yeah. first really take. I thought I was interpreting something wrong. Yeah, me too. I thought I missed something. Yeah, I, <laughs> I was so confused. I was like, they don't mean a real like wraith, do they? Like this got to be, you know, some like, because a lot of people describing it are on drugs. Right, exactly. And then you're know, like, all right, it's a hallucination. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in that part. Um, yeah. And I guess for some context too, like I, I was going to say that when I first started reading the book, I don't know about for how, like what your process was, but I was initially reading it. Like I read most books, which might be, you know, 10 pages here. Then, you know, you get a chunk of time somewhere else and you might read for an hour and then, you know, you try to fit in like five minutes here, 10 minutes there. And I just couldn't get into the book. 
I probably got through 200 pages maybe that way. And it took me, I don't know, I want to say two months to get that yeah. far. Like it was a long time. And then, yeah, like I read most of it when my dad was actually in the hospital. So I was just, I had a lot of time on my hands because there's not much to do in the hospital, right? So I just had my iPad and my Kindle there. And uh, I would read maybe for two hours at a time. And it got way, like the book got way better. I noticed that too. Yeah. Like, I don't know about you, but I have trouble reading for two hours straight for most books. But I think with this one, because it was active in some sense, and I had to work so hard to figure out what the hell was going on, it just... Yeah, it just uh, lended itself better to long reading sessions. Like it's it's an impossible book. Like you won't get through it if you do ten minutes here and there. Yeah, and I, I noticed that I picked up on some of the subtly interwoven threads. Because so, like for context, everyone, each chapter is made up of as many as thirty sub chapters. <laughs> yeah, and a sub chapter could be anywhere from one sentence to thirty pages, and usually whenever it goes to a new sub chapter it's changing the point of view like into a different character who might be in a different place or even in a different year or date and you know sometimes you don't even know what date you're getting dropped into or which character you're getting dropped into until you're a couple pages into it so it's moving around a lot but there's usually a reason that each subsection is within a given chapter and I, f I found it was much easier to pick up on some of those little related things when I read for longer periods than doing the shorter reads, like you said. Yeah, that's, and then you, going back to the dates, like even though they'll have the date in many of these subsections, you, as you said, you don't really know what date that is <laughs> for a while. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it definitely took me until like page 700 or so to get a feel for what the order of the dates was without having to check. Right. It makes you wonder, like, obviously he, I forget what year he died, but it was like 2000, like late 2000s, right? Something like that. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I really wonder what he could have done with a book that was meant to be like, like almost picture like an infinite jest type of book, but that was meant to be accompanied by Google. Like, oh, I could see him doing something really interesting with that. <laughs> this is a tangent, by the way, for sure. But where it was easier to cheat. Yeah, well, basically, like he wrote this without Google being around, right? So yeah, everything kind of had to be in the end notes and stuff. But I wonder if, like, can you imagine if he had like an accompanying website or something that I like, I can't even imagine what it would be like, just no, just seeing this book and like, I guess the manifestation of his brain that this book is, I can't even imagine how many like, references and things he could include if he assumed that the reader had the internet at their disposal. That's a good point. That'd be interesting. Yeah, like the, going back to like the whole active reading thing, right? Rather as opposed to passive. Um, in a weird way, it's kind of like how Netflix is trying to do all the interactive stuff now, too. Yeah. They're like trying to take it from a passive activity to something you participate in. I think David Foster Wallace would still disapprove. Oh, he would. <laughs> <laughs> Similar idea. I wonder if, has anyone tried to make a movie of Infinite Chess? Did you look? Oh, I, I was excited for this part of the conversation. One of my thoughts while reading the book is that Tarantino would have a blast with this. Uh, <laughs> oh, dude, I had the exact same thought. Yeah, He's the yeah. only person I would trust to make this movie. Exactly. Because like the random time jumps and not really random, but yeah, the time jumps and out of order nature. And I, I feel like he could direct this movie. Um, so, okay. So I was going to say but other the other thing related to the movie part. Do you watch The Office or have you watched The Office? Yes. I haven't watched all of it, but. Okay. But you know, like the central characters and stuff. Yeah. So Dwight's cousin who lives on the farm with him, Moe's that the guy who is the actor for Moe's, he's actually a writer for The Office, but then he's like a ran like he occasionally is in episodes. He owns the movie rights to this book. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so actually the first, I never read this book until we decided to do it, but I had read a bunch of essays by uh, David Foster Wallace, primarily because like in interviews with different people associated with The Office, there's like a mutual uh, like love fest in that writer's room or i guess it, there was because not active show anymore but there was like a, a big love for his writing and for his work and also the the like rewatchability of the office a lot of that is tied to influences from dfw so even one of the characters huh. like that's the cfo is david wallace right and that's directly off of david foster wallace <laughs> that's cool yeah so a lot of the writers like bj novak also like he's a huge dfw fan and yeah, it's like that's what first turned me on to his writing. And I'd never read the book, obviously, until we decided to do it because it's a monster. But I always thought at some point I will go do that. One thing I've heard is that BoJack Horseman, the TV show, is 
loosely based on Infinite Jest. Oh, really? Yeah. I've seen like a few things about this, so I kind of want to go explore that again now that we're done with it. Yep. Because I I mean, I absolutely love that show. I think it's like one of the better shows out there. Yeah, but I wonder like rewatching it with this as the context. With that in mind? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Actually, I hadn't heard that before, but I could... I, now I want to rewatch it. This sounds awesome. I could definitely. It, it's a similar style with all of the time jumping and yep. dealing with addiction and like parenting and like self fulfillment and it's a lot of the same themes. That's for sure. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Uh, I was gonna say going back to like the what you just said about addiction. We didn't even talk about that. Yeah, there's definitely a big addiction component to the book, whether that's. Uh, and is this a real thing? I was curious. Like, there's a lot of talk in the book of like marijuana addiction. Yeah, I feel like the jury's kind of out on that. Okay, yeah, because I was gonna say it was like I hadn't heard of that before now, but that could be like '90s science that has since been discredited, or maybe it's real. I I don't know. Like, I'm not saying one way or the other. I just don't know. What I understand is that there is definitely psychological marijuana addiction, but there's not the same physical marijuana addiction that you might get with nicotine or opiates. Yeah, that's what I, was, I mean. That, that was my impression as well. Yeah. But yeah, so but other than that, I mean, DFW, he he himself had a lot of addiction issues with alcohol and I forget what other types of drugs, but I think it's like uh, psychiatric drugs as well. Yeah, that he was taking and uh, suicide does feature somewhat prominently in in the book and in, in the sense that uh, one, I guess, how's father right committed suicide, the, the guy who created the, the entertainment, the movie Infinite Jest, I guess, right? It's so confusing to talk about yeah. this stuff. Because <laughs> we're jumping in and out of the book. Maybe we should give, like, before we go more into plot stuff, we should probably give some broader context of Good idea. some of the main players. So there's, there are basically, like, three groups in the book that have their own separate individual story arcs, group story arcs, and then those intercept uh, throughout the novel more and more as it gets later into it. So you've got this, like, tennis academy and one particular family uh, there's like three brothers, Hal, Oren, and Mario, and their father is the one who made the Infinite Chest movie. And uh, spoiler, but uh, <laughs> and their their mother like still works there. And then Hal and Mario are still going to the tennis academy, but like Mario is disabled. There's like a lot of details we have to decide how much we want to include. But uh, so there's the tennis academy stuff, and like these kids are competitive, but Hal is also addicted to marijuana. And then there's an actual addiction home. That's another group of characters. Yep. And it's like certain characters throughout the novel end up in the addiction home or, you know, get sent out of it. Uh, the core members of it feature throughout pretty consistently. And it's right basically next door to the tennis academy. So there are people who are in the addiction home who work at the tennis academy as well. And then there's... <laughs> this is where it gets really weird. There's like... <laughs> so... The U.S. took over oh, Canada yeah. and Mexico, <laughs> and then it expelled part of Canada from its alliance. I think I'm getting this right with Mexico. And so there's a group of terrorists. There's multiple groups of terrorists. One group of terrorists from Quebec. Yeah, they're like separatists. Like, Yeah, they want Quebec to be its like own country. And then there's another group of terrorists from Canada who are pissed off because the U.S. like destroyed this area of land north of or like around Maine and then made Canada take it back. And it sounds like it's irradiated or something. Yeah. Well, basically, from my interpretation, they took Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire and like, I don't know, there was a little bit more of that, like northern New England part of British Columbia or something. Yeah. And they basically turned it into the place where all the garbage goes from the whole country. From the whole yeah. continent, actually, not just the whole country, the whole continent. And it's basically just a massive dump and also irradiated or something where that they they created this like new mutant hamster or something, right? Yeah, mutant hamster, mutant humans. Yeah. <laughs> and that's supposedly where the wraith came from, too, because its body was buried there. Yep. And so basically there's, you know, one group of terrorists that wants to keep Quebec to be its own thing, a group of Canadian terrorists who want to get back at the U.S. for making them take this. And then there's like the U.S. counterintelligence group who's like trying to fight these two groups. And like the Quebec separatist group is made up of guys in wheelchairs who lost their legs jumping out of the way of trains as a game when they were kids. It's like really 
crazy very oddly specific yeah <laughs> and like and this is the thing this is the thing that i love we've mentioned clearly enough yet is that the book is laugh out loud hilarious at many times <laughs> like I, I think that is the one redeeming quality for how difficult it is to read this is that there is stuff that is just so fucking funny i don't know if i have laughed that hard out loud reading a book and not just like laugh out loud funny it's laugh out loud funny uh, with like some horribly tragic things like yeah i forget which one it was but uh or this 100 percent specific area of the book but it was that girl who had uh remember she had like the daughter or not the daughter the younger sister who was like had something wrong with her and then like the father was was it father or stepfather yeah abusing her yeah and it's just somehow david foster wallace finds a way to even take something like you're reading it and you're horrified and then there's like passages that you're just like i can't help but laugh at what he just said yeah and i think that's what kind of i mean that's part of the as you said redeeming quality of how difficult the book is it's just you'll read a passage and you'll just be like i mean you can't help but laugh actually laugh out loud as you're reading yeah (laughs) or the wheelchair thing like that's even that yeah just the wheelchair thing in general like it's (laughs) it's such an absurd thing you've got like a group of terrorists like so at one point so the the terrorists are like looking for infinite jest because they want to use the movie and then disseminate it throughout the u.s and basically just like kill tons of americans by uh making them watch this movie and dying by entertainment like death by passivity whatever yep and so they're looking for it throughout the novel and they like break into this one place to try to like find it and they end up killing the guy who works there by basically like shoving this like long sharp stick into his mouth down his throat and out his ass and you like read that and you're just like it's but the way it's written it's a little funny and then immediately after they all jump out of their wheelchairs and start climbing around the store with just their arms (laughs) like it's the most absurd like <laughs> description uh for it to go from you know this like <laughs> impaling to these like huge buff canadian dudes like monkey barring around a video store it's it's really ridiculous <laughs> it really makes you wonder what a movie version of this would even like how would you even do it <laughs> yeah i don't know i'm sure somebody could do it like i'm sure someone could do it but it, it would be it would be really difficult uh, <laughs> no but it is it is really funny in in different parts and And some of it's just absurd too like uh one of the counter-terrorist guys in the u.s is like undercover and it sounds like he's a huge like linebacker dude but he has to dress like a woman yeah and it's like very overdone so he's like running around in heels and like (laughs) terrible makeup and a wig and a dress and like fake breasts and yeah and fake breasts that keep like falling over and stuff yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then like there's another character like male character in the novel who's just like completely enamored with her oh yeah <laughs> I remember that. and it's just like the way they're describing it it's like it's the most absurd thing because to anybody i think in real life it would be completely obvious that he's not a woman <laughs> um but then you've got this other character just like obsessed with him and he's like running around trying to prevent the, the u.s from getting destroyed by this entertainment it's like there's so many little things like that where it's not even an explicit joke it's just the absurdity of the thing is amazing <laughs> there's a lot of things where even if this specific line isn't funny it's just the whole situation is so absurd that it ends up being hilarious or like yeah when the kid gets his forehead stuck to the glass oh yeah that was near the end yeah and they're trying to pull him off and It sounds like they, it's really kind of gruesome. It sounds like they end up like ripping off basically half of his face and it's like still stuck to the window later on in the book. It's just. (laughs) Yeah. And it sounds really bad when we're saying it, but somehow he he wrote it in a way that you're just like, this is like still somehow funny as we're reading this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Or the way Jim commits suicide, like, or the description of it partway through the book. With the microwave. Yep. Yeah, he sticks his head in a microwave and then his kid comes down and finds like everything splattered all over the kitchen. Uh, Again, we sound really fucked up talking about how funny this is, but but it's trust us, guys. Like, (laughs) yeah, that I mean, that's like a huge redeeming quality of it. I was going to say the other part that was really interesting and, and also funny, and I think it's around the same part of the book 
is when Hal is like, Hal is is uh, the guy who committed suicide. It's his son. It's the, the kid who walked in afterwards. And uh, as you'd expect, that really fucks up a person. Um, so people are suggesting that he goes to therapy. I think his mom, right? Because his mom is a psychologist or something. Yeah. Or so anyway, people are suggesting that he goes and gets therapy and he's really against the idea and he says, I'm gonna trick the therapist, or he like hates the th- going to therapy, so he's like, Oh, I'm gonna trick them and make them think I'm having like some kind of breakthrough when I'm not. Uh but then he actually has a breakthrough, but in his mind, he thinks he just tricked them. Yeah. I think the breakthrough was that he liked the smell of his father's head in the microwave and he thought it was food. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's why he came downstairs because he wondered what smelled so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is now we sound horrible. Like people are going to stop listening to this. Oh, yeah. I don't know. But <laughs> or uh, the first person who you hear die from the cartridge from Infinite Jest. Oh yeah. Was it the uh, embassy guy? Yeah. <laughs> he. So this guy gets he gets the video in the mail. So someone's basically using it to assassinate him, and then he sits down to start watching it. And so you don't actually hear this happen. You hear somebody else telling you or somebody else describing it happen. Right. So like he starts watching it, but he's, you know, his wife is out for the weekend or something. And then she comes home and he's like dead from dehydration watching this. And she runs over to him, but then she starts watching it. And then she ends up getting sucked in and dying. And like, then some neighbors like smell it or something. And then they come in and then they end up watching it and dying. And oh, then yeah. like eventually police are there. And it's like at the end of it, something like 30 people get sucked into this right. thing. Yeah. And they're all just like stuck in the living room, you know, kind of absorbed around this TV lost. Basically it's like every description of someone getting killed by the video is pretty funny. Yeah. It's funny, but, and it's also kind of interesting that he's making, I think this is probably his central point. Right, this like death by pass- passivity uh, point yeah. of the book, and it's like a meta point almost because, as we said, it has nothing to do really with. I mean, it has something to do with the plot, but it's probably not like the central. Like he doesn't come right out and hit you over the head with this point. It's kind of like the overarching point of the, like. So even the book itself, the fact that you have to flip back and forth and do go with these end notes and kind of do so much work to even figure out what's going on, that in one way by itself is a comment on passive versus active, and then even in the plot with this video and the fact that people are dying by watching something (laughs) um, is in in a large way, like the same idea. Well, I think that it's, and it ties in with all of the strong addiction strains too. Right. It's just like people, you know, I think the broader, the, or one of the big commentaries I picked up on was just like, people want an easy passive life where they are just entertained and where they don't have to deal with, their problems or like work and that's why you have all of these characters who are addicted to drugs and you know a couple try to commit suicide throughout the book um you've got the kids of the tennis academy basically like stuck between wanting to you know get high versus wanting to like win and be the best tennis players in the country you've got the you know father who's trying to be this amazing filmographer and ends up killing himself it's like basically almost every character is stuck between active and passive in some way right right they're stuck between wanting to do the thing they probably know they should do or like give in to this passive life this like you know sitting back and watching tv and also like societal or family expectations as well yeah because i think with how for example uh he put actually there's like a three generation tennis thing right because i think so yeah. how how is kind of like would you say he's like the central character of the book i think yeah i mean i would say like hal and gately yeah so hal is like at the tennis academy uh his father is the one who is the filmmaker who made the entertainment and then who also killed himself via microwave uh but <laughs> that guy was also a tennis player and started the academy actually that hal is training at so hal kind of had that passed on to him but then that guy's jim that guy's name is jim uh, hal's father Jim's father was also a tennis player and really forced Jim to play tennis kind of as a way to compensate for himself. Uh, at least that's what I took from it. I think he didn't yeah. make it or thought he underachieved or something and forced his uh, forced his, his son, who was Jim, to play. And then Jim forced, ha- or maybe not forced. Remember what happened with Jim's father? Yeah. Wait, remind me. I didn't have that in my notes. That's what I was looking for. He like was running to hit a ball or something and fell and then apparently skidded all the way across the court so far that it like 
shredded the bone on both of his knees and he could no longer play. It was something crazy like that. Oh, yeah. That was, yeah. Yeah, where you're you're left thinking, like, how is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> it makes no sense in the laws of physics, but you read it and it's like, all right, that's a little funny. But Yeah. <laughs> I'm seeing a theme here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> physical physical punishment somehow turning funny. Yeah. <laughs> Man, we sound horrible laughing at this, but uh, trust me, if you read these, you will you will also laugh. Yeah, you just give it a chance. Um, but yeah, but near the end, Hal is starting to think about does he even want to play tennis? And he's kind of bouncing between uh and you and he's not probably the only person at the academy thinking about that, but there are uh I think other characters going through similar things of do they want to be playing or I think there's that one guy who wants to be like a commentator or something. And then this other guy who wants to be a dentist, but they're all at this tennis academy and basically doing this full time. Um, And I don't know about you. Like I actually, so growing up playing competitive tennis was like a big part of my, uh, my childhood. And I knew a lot of people at academies and at least from, I've never, you know, trained at an academy or, or stayed at one, but from the description here, it lines up really well with, what I've heard from friends who are living or training at academies. Yeah. I can't imagine it's easy to be at such a high pressure place like that. Yeah. And also like you are a child, right? So you don't really know anything about what you want at that age, especially like some of the kids start at like, even in the book, I think some kids were as young as like 10 or 11. Yeah. Well, there's the one blind seven year old who gets in. Remember? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Which again is another (laughs) somewhat funny, but not when you tell someone. (laughs) Right. If you're like telling someone, oh, yeah, yeah, this book was funny because of the blind seven year old people would just look at you like you need to be locked up. (laughs) But actually on that on that note, you just made there is because you you were saying earlier about how there are these little bits of just like beautiful nonfiction prose interspersed in some of these ideas. Yeah. Um, And it's on that note. He has this discussion of like goals and kids hitting their goals. And so he says. uh, So one realization basically is the context is that you attain the goal and realize the shocking realization that attaining the goal does not complete or redeem you, does not make everything for your life okay as you are in the culture, educated to assume it will do this, the goal. And then you face this fact that what you had thought would have the meaning does not have the meaning when you get it, and you are impaled by shock. We see suicides in history by people at these pinnacles. The children here are versed in what is called the saga of Eric Clipperton. We'll come back to Eric in a minute, but He goes on a little bit later. He says, it may well be that the lower ranked little kids at ETA, the tennis academy, are proportionally happier than the higher ranked kids, since we, who are mostly not small children, know it's more invigorating to want than to have, it seems. Though maybe this is just the inverse of the same delusion. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's just he's got this amazing prose. I feel like that's kind of like myth of Sisyphus also. Yeah, it's very Sisyphean. Yep episode episode something you can find it in your podcast <laughs> <laughs> so on a somewhat of a tangent but very much related to that i saw um so one of my favorite basketball players as frustrating as he is is kyrie irving and uh i had just finished reading a book about the season where uh him and lebron and the Cavs won the nba title like two years ago and funny enough i was just going through my sports news this morning and there was this kind of interview with him of where he said after he won the title he was pissed off for like a month and he couldn't quite explain it but that quote the the uh passage from the book that you just read out loud pretty much explains it he like wasn't sure why he was pissed off for the whole like he was like oh, i didn't really feel happy until way later when i could say oh i'd won a championship but in the immediate time after like he said even at like the parade he wasn't really thrilled and they had pictures of him and he wasn't like smiling too much i mean his every smile looked kind of forced like he was like forced to be there yeah he said he like kept thinking about when the next game was and there wasn't a next game obviously because the season's over it kind of is exactly like like i feel like athletes in general have this issue especially who are prodigy athletes because you start so early and you might never get a chance to really have these like tough internal dialogues about what you want and the goals you're actually going after and I feel like, I don't know about you, I would say for me, it was only in the last couple of years that I probably started thinking more about uh, it's not like the attainment or the achievement that really brings the happiness or the satisfaction. It's like the chase and the the climb, basically. Yeah. But I definitely didn't feel like I had a grasp on that until maybe last year. Uh, and, I, you know, I'm sure it's still a process, but I didn't even have that thought. Like I kept thinking before, 
that it was all about the, okay, like once you achieve that, you'll be, you know, happy. Once you're at that level, it'll be good. But it's, of course it's not right. Like that's not how we're wired and that's not how life works. Infinite game. Did you feel like you had a grasp on that before or like? No, I, I mean, the way I think about it is that I have known that conceptually for a while, but despite knowing that conceptually, I don't know that I have done a good job of internalizing that to the point where it affects my day-to-day like expectations and actions, right? I would say recent, like maybe in the last year, I've noticed for you that you constant like as soon as you feel like you're close to not me not mastering but you have a grasp on something you go in a different direction like you zag a little bit like you know you move to something related but different like i would say cup and leaf cafe is like the perfect example like you probably feel like you have some grasp on cup and leaf the e-commerce business and then you're like okay let's start this one too right and yeah it's related but you it's like a totally new challenge i'm not sure i do a healthy version of it <laughs> Yeah. No, no, I'm not saying it's like a healthy version, but it, I don't know if you consciously make these decisions, but at least as an external observer, it feels like you do a good job of like finding new hills to climb as opposed to, you know, almost like getting bored on the hill that you're on. Like you, you don't abandon the hills you're on, but you find new challenges that you like someone who's cynical may look at it and be like, what does Nat know about running a cafe? And I, again, external observer of you feel like that that's the exciting part for you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I have felt for a while like my main goal or like driving force or whatever is just boredom aversion. Right. Like, mm. <laughs> that's a good one. I just don't want to be bored of my life. Yeah. And that might sound like selfish and petty or whatever, but I feel like it's not a bad barometer for what you're doing. Right. It's also not the worst motivation either. Like, no. And it's like, there's definitely big grand things that you could be super motivated and driven by. But like when I think about it at root, like I'm mostly just driven by not getting bored of things. Yeah. For better or worse. I like I was going to say, going back to the Kyrie Irving example, probably from the time. So his dad was a basketball player, like a D1 basketball player. And he apparently started training at age four, like actually training. Jeez. <laughs> so probably from the age of four, and I think he won the title when he was 26 or 27. I think that was how old he was at that time. I mean, think about it. You're probably having some of your earliest memories at age four, <laughs> right? So from his earliest memories to when he won the title, that's probably all he was like saying, I'm motivated to become a champion, right? And like be an NBA champ, like be the world champion. And okay, now you got it. And I can see why he was pissed off because probably like built it up in, in your head. Um, it's like, oh, everything will be great when that happens. It's like, wait a minute. I'm still the same person after. Yeah. I saw a good tweet from Taylor. Taylor Pearson, who was on for our crypto episode back in the day, where he he said something like business, for the most part, isn't that complicated. It's just that founders eventually get bored and start mixing things up. And then that's what creates more of their issues. Mm. Right. Like, I feel like there's a lot of truth to that, where there is a like self detrimental aspect to hitting your goal or losing the impetus to perform, right? Like when I think about the times that I've been most productive and most focused, it's usually that there was some like fear of death or at least perceived existential, you know, reason that I needed to work super hard. Mm, And when you remove that motivator, I think it's hard to have the same level of energy and like that level of energy is really intoxicating. Right. Oh, definitely. It's like a, like, yeah. I mean, that's probably in the same way. I mean, it's going to sound really crass to compare business and like war. And I hate, you know, I don't, I usually don't like when people do it, but it's definitely a, (laughs) there's definitely something to it. But we're going to do it anyway. Yeah. I'm going to do it. That's my disclaimer for I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, And if you get mad at me, it's okay. (laughs) But yeah, it's probably in the same way why like people who've been through horrible things in, in wars will still say they miss war. Yeah. And you're like, oh, that was a horrible time in your life. Why do you miss it? But those like people you'll hear people say it it made them feel alive. And I obviously haven't been to a war, but I've been in the situations like what you were just describing, where you have some either fear of like your business shutting down or just something external that's forcing you to really kind of be at the top of your game. And in a weird way, when things are kind of stable and working the way they're supposed to, you're like, Hey, this is kind of boring. I want I want that feeling back. Yeah. <laughs> 
which is it sounds crazy. Like it's why humans are not rational creatures because rationally that makes no sense. But there's like a feeling you get when your back's against the wall and you have to perform. That's different from like when things are working fine and and that's like objectively that's better. It just doesn't feel the same way. There's a really good line in uh, the hard thing about hard things, a book by Ben Horowitz, and also excellent porno title. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I wonder if he's I'm sure he's heard that before, but that, I, I'd never heard that before, so I, I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> on, on the list of book titles that would also be excellent porn titles, that's pretty high up there. <laughs> um, but no, what I was going to say is he's got a good line in there where it's basically like, if you're worried, you can feel safe, and if you feel safe, you should be worried. Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. I always think about that when I start to feel worried, but then the problem with that is that if you feel safe because you feel worried, like well now you feel safe, so <laughs> now you're stuck in a loop. Should I be worried again? Yeah, infinite loop. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get out the strange loop. It's like the awareness of it throws you into an infinite loop. Yeah, exactly. I think but the awareness is still helpful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. These I guess it just helps you not panic too. Yeah. That's the other one is like thinking that, oh I'm worried this is I don't know. It's it, as I'm saying this out loud. I'm like, yeah, but you could also get caught like when you're not worried, then thinking you should be worried, and then making a mountain out of a molehill. It's the issue with these overly simple platitudes. You yeah, know? exactly. But... <laughs> hey, it looks good on a tweet, man. Yeah, it looks if it fits well on a tweet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That's all you need. <laughs> <laughs> Skin in the game would also be an acceptable porno title. Yeah, so would come again. That's a good. That's a good porno <laughs> title. <laughs> <laughs> discipline and punish is probably the most appropriate one that we've done we've done a lot of we've done a lot of good well i mean not a lot but we've done uh 12 rules for life probably wouldn't be a good one that one wouldn't really fit no it'd be very weird go to lesser pock would be a really weird one <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what they would put in that <laughs> strange loops strange loops <laughs> try to think mastery might be an okay one mastery would work mastery could be, be an okay title be an okay title <laughs> Amusing ourselves to death. That could be a weird one. I could see some weird things happening in that one. Actually, that's a, that's a good segue because... I swear I didn't do that on purpose. I was just trying to think of the episodes, Yeah, no, but... <laughs> ooh. <laughs> the tangent comes full circle, you know? It's, it's a strange loops. There we go, closing the loop. <laughs> yeah. But no, it is funny how much this overlapped with a lot of the ideas in Amusing Ourselves to Death. Like, in many ways... Infinite Jest is like the fiction version of amusing ourselves to death, I thought. I 100% agree with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if they ever came across each other or um, they had to have. Similar time frames and definitely similar ideas. Yeah. And like a strong aversion to TV, like TV in particular, yeah. I think uh, David Foster Wallace is like not at all a fan of. Like he doesn't, correct me if you interpreted something differently, but in my opinion, he like, he doesn't like a lot of things about media at that time in general, but TV like draws the most attention for him. Yeah. Like he doesn't talk about newspapers and things the same way that uh, I would say in amusing ourselves to death, like he definitely still criticized newspapers, um, obviously focused more on TV. He just criticized the idea of news in general, but then TV got also the main part of his wrath. But DFW really hates TV from what I gathered. Yeah. And I think it comes from slightly different places. I got the sense that amusing ourselves to death, the issue was uh, trivia, right? In minutia. Yeah. And like overvaluing that. And for DFW, I think the issue is passivity. Yes. And like refusal to take action. So in that sense, they're coming from different places, but they arrive at a similar idea of, you know, living an active life, I think, and active consumption too. Yeah, like not letting life kind of happen to you. Yeah. It's probably one of his central themes here. Because even with the addiction stuff, like, and I think probably some of this is autobiographical, I'd imagine. Um, I don't know for sure. I'm sure there's like a biography of David Foster Wallace that probably gets more into this, but this is pure speculation on my part. But I imagine since he kind of dealt with some of these issues himself, I'm sure he felt the passive nature of addiction, kind of like letting the addiction take mm -hmm. over. And then has probably felt the other side, obviously, as well, when he breaks out of the addiction phase um, and kind of takes more active control of his life. And at, at least from my understanding of his biography, obviously, I haven't read anything too deep, just kind of some things online. Uh, he kind of 
yo-yoed back and forth. Like he went through periods of addiction and then got out and was like incredibly productive. And then, you know, I think he had bouts of alcoholism. Uh, and then eventually he did commit suicide. Although I don't know all the details about that or why, or if he ever left a note or anything like that. But I know that he had kind of yo-yoing with addiction um, and spent time in rehab centers and things like that. Yeah. And he almost romanticizes getting clean from addiction, it seems. It's like a hero's journey in a way for him. Yeah, it is. that's a good way of putting it. He's got a, a chapter somewhere around the middle of the book where it's just like every paragraph is a sentence about things you learn from AA and getting clean from addiction. And it's a lot of the like super insightful single line things that I think he does a really great job of in many of his other works too. Like all of these would work very, very well as Twitter platitudes if like Naval tweeted them or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you get the sense that there are things that he himself learned from his own challenges. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I think the same is true for some of the some of the tennis chapters that probably don't even apply to only tennis. Kind of like in your game of tennis actually. There's some interesting overlaps there. Uh, but I have this one passage fairly early on in the book. He's talking about tennis, but it's really could be about any endeavor, really, uh, especially competitive endeavor. So I'll just read it from the book. It's on page 84. So he says, the true opponent, the enfolding boundary is the player himself, always and only the self out there on court to be met, fought, brought to the table to hammer out terms. The competing boy on the net's other side, he is not the foe. He is more the partner in the dance. He is the, what is the word, excuse or occasion for meeting the self, as you are his occasion. Tennis's beauty's infinite roots are self-competitive. You compete with your own limits to transcend the self in imagination and execution. Disappear inside the game. Break through limits. Transcend. Improve. Win. Which is why tennis is an essentially tragic enterprise. To improve and grow as a serious junior with ambitions, you seek to vanquish and transcend the limited self whose limits make the game possible in the first place. It is tragic and sad and chaotic and lovely. All life is the same as citizens of the human state. The animating limits are within to be killed and mourned over and over again. There's a lot of finite and infinite games in there. Yeah, I actually <laughs> highlighted the exact same passage. Yeah. <laughs> it's in my notes too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, it's like it was about tennis, but it didn't have to be about tennis. Like there's a lot of, I mean, pretty much as he says, all life is the same. I mean, that you could apply that passage to a lot of things. And it's like inner game of tennis, another excellent episode. Yep, exactly. Um, but I think in like in, in a weird way, tennis and boxing and or like martial arts, uh, like sports that are one on one, uh, it's the most obvious. Like these things get brought to the forefront. Whereas when you have a team, you obviously add this the interpersonal and the social things on top of that. So you might have obviously it's your psychology, but it's also your teammate psychology, and there's a lot of confounding variables that come into play. But when it's one on one, because I've I, I've read books by or and I, I did train for a while too in in mixed martial arts, and there were a lot. And as growing up as a tennis player, like I felt a lot of similar things on the mental side in martial arts as I did with tennis. Like it was very strange because um, I didn't expect that. Like physically, they're very different sports. Uh, like they're not at all. Like there's barely anything you could say that's similar besides the fact that they're one on one, but mentally there's a lot of similar things in that you're yeah you're going against another person but you're mainly fighting your own brain um in a lot of ways it's very it's very weird like it's very hard to put into words also but i think that passage does a much better job than than i ever could well it may even to go back to what we were talking about before expand out to some of this discussion of addiction and action and passivity right absolutely like it's not really about the drug or tv it's about you right and like your ability to transcend it and step out of it like whatever it is for you and you could say you could actually apply it to any limitation really yeah right like any circumstance that's limiting you or yeah i mean you could apply it to a lot of a lot of things and maybe that's what he's trying to show is like okay yeah like your opponent is your yourself and i guess he's talking about limits and transcending limits and that's kind of applies to most things because yeah i mean circumstances can really affect somebody and hurt somebody but then there's always i think jordan peterson said it like there's always a way to make things worse 
Um, yeah. But there's probably also a way to make things better. And that's kind of the battle that's going on, right? And, and that's internal for every human being, everybody who's going through anything, which is probably every human being is going through something. Um, just, I mean, there's obviously different levels of battles and different things that people are going through, but everybody's probably fighting something, even if it's just a tennis match, right? Like there's probably something going on, some battle going on in their brain. Well, every character is is fighting some sort of internal struggle throughout the novel as well. Exactly. And they usually do fall into one of those few camps, right? Either struggling with these tennis expectations, struggling with addiction, or struggling with like the geopolitical conflict and <laughs> revenge, right? Like that's, I don't know. I All of the AFR political stuff seemed the most out of place compared to the rest of it. Agreed. <laughs> It, I think it made it more, much more of an absurd book, like with that stuff in there. Yeah. Imagine if that wasn't in there. It would be a very interesting, like it would definitely be a note, noteworthy book. It'd probably be a lot shorter if that stuff wasn't in there, but it wouldn't have the same like chaotic, like what the fuck is going on type of feeling. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be the same without it. And to be fair, like there's a big chunk of the book that takes place between one of the wheelchair guys and the U.S. operative who has to dress like a woman just like standing on a cliff talking and right <laughs> like all of their dialogue is particularly beautiful and interesting and a lot of it centers around what they want to do with the entertainment and you know what it sort of says about humanity and this death by passivity and their you know relative motivations like it's it's really beautiful prose and it's it's both like outside of the other going ons in the novel, but it's you know it all ends up very interwoven at the end. Everything eventually comes together. Yeah. So on a related note to that, though, I was going to say that uh, I wonder if anyone has ever published or it's out there somewhere um, the interactions between DFW and his editor. <laughs> well, apparently, when he turned it in, he said all typos intentional. Oh really? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I wonder like that that's that's awesome. I didn't know that. <laughs> I, that may be apocryphal, but I remember reading that somewhere. That's really cool. <laughs> but the thing is like there are a lot of little typos in the book, but they're always read as a like misspeaking by the narrator at that moment because there's a lot mm. of different narrators, you don't know who some of them are. And some of them like make their own little meta commentary on what's going on, but you have no idea who's making the meta commentary. And like they get things wrong, like they'll get years wrong and dates wrong. That brings up a good question: Who is the narrator? Well, I don't know. I mean, because it jumps around between first, second, and third person, right? And the third person narrators change quite a bit. There's multiple first person narrators. I'm gonna Google this. Sometimes you're reading a letter like that came from one character to another or you're reading like a transcript of a conversation and then it's like well who recorded the transcript like why do we have this exactly right or you're reading an excerpt from a magazine right and like there's just so many different ways the story is told uh there, there's one entire sub chapter written in uh what's it called when you write like someone speaks oh colloquially I don't think that's the right one I'm thinking of, but it's like it's written as if it was spoken by someone who has like a really, really uh, what's a good term for this? Uh, unintelligent grasp of the human language. And like you've got to work super hard to understand what they're saying. Kind of like if anyone's read Cloud Atlas, that whole middle section of Cloud Atlas written in uh, dialect. That's what I'm thinking of. Yep. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so it's there's just like so many different ways it's told throughout the story. So apparently in an interview, he said that the disjointed nature of the narration is an expression of how he experienced the world, hmm. which is freaking wild. <laughs> like, it's very weird. He can say whatever he wants. <laughs> that's true. He could. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, apparently, no, like he would say like sometimes he would experience events and like feel like he was narrating his own like seeing what he's doing as a third person and then there'd be other times it feels first person it was just like disjointed i'm sure we all do that to an extent he might have just been more aware of it yeah because there's probably i mean i think we all at sometimes look at what we're doing in the third person 
Like now that I'm thinking about it, I'm doing that. <laughs> like I can't help it. And now that you're listening to us talking about that, you are doing it too. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I'm sure we all do that. He might just, he seems good at like putting into words things that might be lurking in your thoughts somewhere. Yeah. And maybe that's why some of these passages feel so like particularly like, uh, what's the right word? Almost like penetrating through like riffraff and getting straight to like actually deep into a real point. Maybe it's because he's good at like taking these thoughts that everybody in some way, shape or form is thinking, but not concretely and then putting them into words. Yeah. Yeah. This discussion has been more focused than I expected it to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. As we were reading, we kept texting each other being like, how are we going to do this book exactly? <laughs> um, oh, one thing I did also want to talk about. There's no real order to any of these points, whatever. It's fine. No, no. It's just whatever comes up. Kind of like the book. Kind of like the book, actually. Yeah. Uh, so he didn't like irony. Like he thought it was an overused tactic, I guess. Um, was that in one of the blog posts that we read also? Which we should put these in the in the show notes, uh, which we will. There's some really good blog posts that smarter people than us, I think, have written about what actually happened. <laughs> yeah, there was. it was in one of the ones that you had sent me, I think. Uh, and it was basically just saying that some people read it and think that he wrote it to like be ironic basically to like just waste your time and tease you with a hard book and they basically say like no it's not what he did he wasn't trying to be ironic like it was a deliberate style yeah and i think you texted me one of those quotes right yeah let's see here oh no no no, you didn't okay so anyway i think the irony point was more uh, yeah i see it i see the quote that i had um i think he wanted you to actually feel like in this book so i know some people are under the impression that he is an ironic writer like i've definitely heard that before but i think what he's trying to get you to do in the book and i would say he does a pretty good job of that is seeing the uh or feeling actual emotions or or i guess as we were talking about being active as opposed to passive um and he definitely views irony as almost like a safety valve that people use to avoid feeling real things um like he has mario say something like Mario, the character, so Hal's younger brother, um, he says this, I guess, in his head. I don't think Mario's actually saying this out loud, but he's saying how people interact uh, with each other. And he's, and this is from the book. He says, it's like, there's some rule that real stuff can only get mentioned if everybody rolls their eyes or laughs in a way that isn't happy. Uh, and I, I don't know about you, Nat. I would say I've definitely observed that, even like I've observed myself doing that and I've observed like all of us, I feel like doing that, you'll, like, you'll be at a dinner with somebody or someone will say something, you know, like a group and someone will say something real and then we'll like, you know, laugh it off to avoid the deep conversation. Like, do you have a sense of what I'm talking about? Yeah. And that may also be meta commentary on the book itself. Yeah. Where he takes these very serious things and then needs to wrap them in absurd, funny incidents to like get them through. Yep. Yeah. To like make them tolerable or digestible in some way. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, I don't know. That was like, again, it has, there's no order to these things, but that was just, I thought an interesting point. And also it was interesting that he made Mario say that because Mario has, what's Mario's issue again? It sounds like a few things. It sounds like he's got some sort of just general retardation. Yeah. Like I'm using that in the clinical sense, not the root sense. I guess I shouldn't say that. Should yeah. I? Like he's like a child basically. Yeah. He's, he's like, younger than he is biologically yeah but then he's also got uh i'm gonna put my foot in my mouth again but like gimped arms it sounds like right he doesn't have fully functioning hands so he's because he's older than hal but he's very much treated like a child yeah and he kind of behaves like a child too although apparently very good with video and so he would spend a lot of time with his father doing video stuff. Oh, right. Exactly. He was the one doing a lot of the recording, I think, for his father. Yeah. Um, oh, I guess we should also mention this. Um, the president of whatever the union entity is between Canada, the United States, and Mexico uh, is an entertainer. Yeah. And has some hilarious parallels to Trump. It's, yeah, it's like... It's uncanny. <laughs> It's, it's a little uncanny at times. Some of the other stuff with him is just hilarious. It's like more of the absurdity. And you learn everything about the president through a... It's like a finger puppet play, right? Yeah. <laughs> that Mario does in the middle of the book. Yep. Which 
<laughs> it's just like there's so many funny ways that you learn about things. But yeah, <laughs> the president's like a former entertainer who's obsessed with cleanliness, which is why he creates the giant like trash dump in the Northeast. And then he tricks Canada and Mexico into becoming allies with us and then like turns on Canada. And that's where all of the terrorist stuff comes from. Yeah. <laughs> Man. <laughs> yeah. But I think like, you know, uh, so going back to like more of the meta commentary, it's like he is showing or I think what something he was trying to show is like by the subsidized years, the fact that the years have sponsorship or advertising attached to them. And then the president being an entertainer is uh, some of the effect of TV, like resulting it. So in TV, for example, right, everything is kind of up for sponsorship. Like there's ads in the show, there's ads between, you know, scenes. And so in his way, he's like, okay, everything is then going to like logic, like the logical extension of that is everything will then have advertising attached to it. Um, yeah, that's kind of what happened. And that was definitely pretty prescient. I mean, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's what we've seen where all of our communication is filtered through ads now. Yeah. I mean, you've written a lot about that, like in terms of, I mean, Facebook is a big one, but yeah, you see it everywhere. I mean, you, you've talked a lot even about, I think on previous episodes about like ad blocker and yeah trying to not see ads anywhere when like google scans your emails to determine what ads to show you yeah like that's creepy google uses google maps to collect more data on you to give you better ads like there's a lot of stuff like that that's pretty freaking creepy when you dig into it yep there was a good episode on i think we talked about this last episode there was a good episode on sam harris recently the trouble with facebook Oh, no, I haven't listened to that. I don't know if we talked about it. Maybe we talked about it. I think when we were catching up. Maybe we were catching up. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think it's called The Trouble with Facebook. And it's like one of the original Facebook investors who since has said that they're, you know, bad people um, talking about everything Facebook and Google and all of them do. It's terrifying and fascinating. Highly recommend it. Yeah, I got to listen to that. I've seen the book. I've seen the book uh, or at least the name of that book floating around. I just haven't I haven't listened to the episode yet. Uh, that sounds interesting, though. But it was very like he was uh, David Foster Wallace was spot on in seeing that trend happening. And I'm sure he's not the only one who was talking about it at that time. But it just feel the book was written in 96, right? Mm, yeah. So even pre like first Internet boom, it's kind of like that was just getting started at that time, which is probably why there's not much about the Internet in here. Yeah. And the other thing he predicted, which I thought was one of the most hilarious and amazing chapters in the book is Snapchat filters. You remember that section? Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. He's got a whole chapter talking about the fictional rise and fall of video calls. And it's another thing that's like just very brilliantly insightful. Or basically, the short version of it is he says, like, at some point, we developed the technology to like call each other and, you know, see each other's faces. But then people realized that they could no longer pretend to be listening to people while they were on the phone with them. And so... <laughs> they and so they didn't like video calls as much because and it, it goes like a side thing there where he says like the amazing thing about phones is that you can be paying half attention while assuming the other person is giving you their full attention right not not realizing exactly. that you know obviously <laughs> they're probably doing the same thing and so then the the videography phone the phone videography whatever technology allows you to project a mask onto your face to make it look like you were paying rapt attention while you were doing other things. Uh, but then once people were able to put a mask on their face to make them look like they're paying attention, they wanted the mask to look more and more attractive until, you know, they were just like <laughs> absurdly blown out of proportion, you know, gorgeous, sexy human <laughs> avatars, at which point people weren't really having video calls anymore. And they just went back to normal calls. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I thought it was one of my favorite chapters of the book. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, do you do a lot of video calls? Like, I hate video calls. I hate same. them. I hate them. Yeah, I hate them. Yeah. I actually will get pissed off when someone's like, well, like you'll think you're just doing a Sc Skype audio call or something, and then they'll have their video on, and I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I really don't want to do this. I just I just leave it off. And like, if they ask, I'm like, no, we're just doing audio. Yep. Yep. Smart. I mean, Ed, like, I love you, but I also, it's better for us doing this recording over audio, I think, than video. Because like, there's in person and then there's phone calls, but like video phone calls are just like weirdly awkward because you have to, it's like, how much eye contact should I be making at any one moment? And I can't, <laughs> it's like, if you and I are talking face to face, we're looking at other stuff in the room, we're pointing at things like 
or making intermittent eye contact, but you never actually make eye contact in a video call because you're looking at the camera or the person. Right. And so yep. you're just like playing this game of pretending to look at them in the <laughs> eyes while not really doing it, just like so that you can see the other person not really looking at you either. Like I just, it's absurd. I really just don't like video calls. And there's sometimes uncanny delays in the video. Yeah. So you think like, so you're responding to people's facial cues, but then you're weirdly off. Yeah, it's definitely not like being in, in person and it's subpar to being on the phone. Yeah. even Because on the phone, you can't even pretend that you have body language to go off of. You just have to interpret someone's voice. Um, but it's like so related to what he, he was talking about in the book. It's kind of shocking, like given how easy it is to do a video call. It's shocking on one level, but he totally predicted it, uh, like how unpopular video calls are. Like I, I was going to say barely I ever do a video or even people even suggest doing video calls. Like they're just I think most people would say like agree with your opinion. They just don't like them. I, I don't like them either. The only time I do them is for my weekly team calls. Mm. All right. And I think that's an acceptable situation because it's like one, there's eight of us or seven of us. And it's like helpful to have some facial expressions with like the fact that we're a remote team. Right. That's what I was going to say. You guys are a fully remote team. Like, it's not like you have that in person basis to compare it to. Yeah. And we're also expecting each other to be like fully present and there. Right. Whereas, like, if I'm talking to you on the phone, I can do the dishes while I'm doing that. Right. <laughs> and I don't expect you to not do the dishes and to like sit perfectly still in your chair and do nothing else while you're talking to me. Right. Like, right. That's not really. I think how people even communicate in person, right? Like you might sit down and have a conversation with someone, but there's usually other environmental stuff to like use up some of your focus that is pretty natural. Or you talk while you're like making dinner. Right? Like it's not absurd to be lightly distracted while talking to someone. Yeah. Whereas if you're doing a video chat, like very often you're in, right in front of the computer, it feels weird to be doing anything else. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's just not popular. And I think for all the reasons that, he's talking about i mean yeah. he doesn't talk about some of the like uncanny facial uh cues kind of thing but i mean I, he was spot on that it would did not become popular <laughs> like i don't know anybody who would say like that they i mean maybe there are people but i definitely haven't met them or maybe i filter them out because they like video calls <laughs> yeah. well and to the to the extent that video is popular it's mediated video right it's exactly it's not live or it's live but it's not like there are definitely people who stream live, but it's not the, it's not like a phone call. It's not like I'm saying, oh, I want to catch up with Nat. I'm just going to FaceTime video him. Like that doesn't feel normal. Yeah. If you FaceTime video me, I'm just going to call you back. Don't block me. <laughs> <laughs> block you. Podcast over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tangent. I like, I love how many people thought that we had a fight. Oh yeah, everyone thought we broke up. <laughs> yeah, man. I got I got this is how many like um, we obviously got Twitter messages about it, yeah. but I got LinkedIn messages about it from some listeners who are well two with two different listeners. Not I, I say some listeners, like there's a group of them. Uh but it's two people <laughs> who sent me LinkedIn messages saying that you and Nat need to make up. Yeah. No, I had uh I had a couple of people like email me or something after I said that we were doing episodes again and they were like, Oh, I'm so happy to hear you guys like figured it out and made up. And I was like, <laughs> no, that's Man, we should have milked that. We should have milked that and made it like some more drama, like done some solo episodes posted under made you think. And like start doing debates. Yeah. Start like a, like an East coast, West coast rep beef or something. <laughs> there we go. Be like, yeah, I don't like Nat cause he moved to Austin. Yeah. I hate people from Texas. Nat moved to Texas, therefore I hate him. Neil said he doesn't want to do tangents anymore. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, we could have milked that. We could have we could have like had it become some kind of Twitter controversy. People being team Nat, team Neil. Team Neil. Oh well, missed opportunity. I think we need a lot more followers for that. Well, well yeah, I know. <laughs> Maybe when this is at like the hundred thousand plus per episode mark, instead of just like the ninety nine thousand per episode per mark, we'll uh Yeah, we'll do a staged beef. Staged beef. <laughs> That'd be funny. Neil said he didn't like Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> Neil unfollowed Pepper. Neil unfollowed Pepper on Instagram. <laughs> Pepper is the new co-host. There we go. She's, she's always been the co-host. She's always a co-host. I'm sure Andres appreciates not having to edit her out anymore. Those were the days. <laughs> Those were the early days when Pepper was super young. Yeah, when she was still a baby and 
slightly more insane than she is now. <laughs> yeah, now she now she knows. She knows when to, to go on a tangent or not. She knows when the mic comes out. She's gotta <laughs> calm down, have some have some Rishi mushroom coffee and take a nap. <laughs> I don't know if you can give your dogs Rishi mushrooms. I, I don't recommend it. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't don't endorse that. That's not medical advice. <laughs> I am neither a doctor nor veterinary. <laughs> So what do you think, dude? Should we like should we do another book like this? We should definitely do another fiction book at some point. I don't know. Do you have any candidates for what because we should start now and we have six months to do it because that's like our average pace of these big fiction books. Yeah, it took us about a year and a half to do this one. So Yeah, and Atlas, I think we took at least six months, if not more. Yeah, Atlas was like Well, Atlas was a lot easier. Atlas was a lot easier than this book. I, I was gonna actually yeah. say that at the beginning, that this is like we we I think complained about Atlas when we were doing the episode. We complained about the length of it and the amount of time it took, but this dwarfed Atlas Shrugged. Yeah, Atlas is like a walk in the park compared to this. Yeah, even just the language and like the straightforward nature of the plot in Atlas Shrugged. Yeah, is, yeah. The complexity, <laughs> just everything, so much easier. Uh, actually, on that, how did you? Because I realized we didn't mention this at all. How did you use the reading companion? Uh, because Ooh. for everyone listening, yes, we need to link to that in the show notes. Yeah. We, we used a reading companion called Elegant Complexity as you're going through the book. And I don't know about you, but it was a game changer for me. So it was a game changer. I would say I used it much more in the first probably 600 page, 500, 600 pages than after when I was doing these like longer reading sessions. I was kind of getting into it and didn't need it as much. But that said, I don't think I would have gotten through the first 500 pages without the reading companion. And I still used yeah. it after. It's just like, with the first 500 pages, I felt like I was reading maybe a couple pages or, or like maybe a little bit of a chapter and then going into the reading companion. And I kind of wish, I don't know about you, did you get, you got the Kindle version of the reading companion, right? Mm -hmm. I kind of wish I had, so the Kindle version of the book is essential. I would highly recommend that unless you want to do the true DFW page flipping thing. <laughs> uh, so that I would highly suggest the Kindle. I kind of wish I got the physical copy of the companion. So that I could have had that open in front of me with the Kindle also in front of me, you know, like that would have been really interesting to like read it literally side by side. I mean, I guess you could do that, which you could like open up one on the computer or like if you have two Kindles, like open one up on one and one on the other. But I did find it annoying to like switch back and forth on the Kindle. Yeah, that was what I realized because in the beginning, I would switch back and forth after every sub chapter. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> so it's like, what is happening right now? Yeah, because I was like, what the hell is going on? And then as I got further in, I like slowed it down a lot. And I realized it was more helpful to like read for a long period and then read the reading companion for everything I just read at the end as like yep. uh, to try to, you know, like redistill it. And I don't know, there's just a lot of little things it was very helpful for like even just keeping the characters straight. <laughs> yeah, keeping the characters straight, keeping the dates straight. Yeah. And even like little things where. I, I either like missed it or I didn't, you know, digest it because I thought it was some sort of metaphor or something. But there's like a really, really crucial plot point in the first 20 pages. Uh, we can reveal it. It's like it's Hal digging up his father's head. Oh, yeah. And for whatever reason, when I read it, I like didn't digest that. And then I saw it in the well, reading guide. You, and I was right? Like, I mean, how yeah. could you? Because you don't know who the father... Like, there's no context for anything. You don't even know who Hal is at that point. Yeah, well, and you also don't assume that, like, a kid being interviewed by a college board is thinking about digging up his father's grave. Right. Oh, yeah, we should say what the opening scene... Like, that opening scene is just Hal is, I guess, being interviewed by a college board because it's the University of Arizona, I think, right? Yeah, U of Arizona. Yeah, and he's going to play tennis there, and, like, they, I guess the tennis coach is there, and the his uncle is there. And then there's some people on the act, uh, some professors, is it professors or like a dean, assistant dean or something like that? A dean or someone, yeah. Yeah, and they're like interviewing him, but there's some weird stuff that happens in that. But I guess, yeah, that's when, that's the context for when he's also thinking about digging up his father's head and you're just like, wait, what is going on right now? Yeah, and the <laughs> fact that he does that doesn't get mentioned again until the very end of the book. Yes, so a thousand something pages later. <laughs> yeah, and you kind of like need to know that he does that for like, context of other things that happen so for like catching little things like that it was super super useful yeah uh, well I, I would say the guide was great how did you hear about the guide because you're the one that told me about that one uh my friend matan had just finished infinite jest and so i asked him if he used any kind of guide to help him and he recommended this one but then 
I also like did some Googling around for the best reading guide. And this one was the one that kept coming up. So I was like, because I, I don't know about you, but I, I'd already tried to read it twice. Oh, I hadn't. So I'd heard about it many times, but I'd never attempted it. Yeah. So th- this was like third time's the charm. And, I, you know, I basically said like, okay, I'm just not going to have the energy or patience to do this without the reading guide. So I'm just going to get it. And I'm super glad I did because it made a huge difference. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. I don't think I would have made it through uh, <laughs> even the first no. few chapters without it. Yeah. And by the way, the reading guide is also 600 pages yeah so (laughs) you're really reading about 2,000 pages by the time you're done with this thing yeah this is a this is definitely a uh a project for sure but it's um i don't know i would say like okay this is gonna be a good a good question i i don't know maybe i'm gonna i'm not gonna try to guess your answer but i think i know would you recommend this uh i mean like with a caveat right i think that if if we weren't doing it for this, I wouldn't tell myself to read it. Right. Right. Like I the only people I would suggest to read it are the ones who really, really want to like grapple with it and be challenged. Like if you're willing to go into it not liking it and having to like struggle the whole way then cool, like go do it. But it's a ringing endorsement. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> But I wouldn't recommend it if you're like looking for a good book to read. Yes, right? I 100% <laughs> like, agree with you. Yes, if you're just if you're like, oh, recommend me a book, right? I would not. Infinite Jest would not be near. Yeah, I'd be like bottom of my list. Yeah, right. <laughs> if you're looking for like a project or something to like engage your brain in a very active, this is not a book. Like in the way that you think of, oh, I'm gonna go read a book. This is not that type of book. Yeah, you don't bring this to the beach with you. No, you like. <laughs> sit down with a legal pad and fight with it right yeah <laughs> or you take the easy way out like we did and use the reading companion but like, exactly <laughs> but even with that it's not that easy because you still get to the end being like what the fuck happened and have to go read a whole bunch of blog posts speculating on you know what might have happened yep <laughs> so yeah i don't know it like it just takes a certain like masochistic reader i think to enjoy it and you know it's like when I hear that it's someone's favorite book, I'm like very suspicious, right? Right. It might be like, I know I saw this Twitter thread. I think, what was it? Three, four days ago about uh, like the great books one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess for the people who don't follow Nat at Nat Eliason on Twitter, um, what was that thread all about? I was basically just, well, so it started as one thing, which was that part of why some great books are assigned and like are consistently assigned uh is that it's a way of like class signaling and filtering right so it's like we don't care that or like i don't care that you've read hamlet but i care that you're the kind of kid who went to a school where you had to read hamlet Mm. right and then the expansion on that was like that's why colleges like harvard make you read books like ulysses because it's like the ultimate class and status signaling book right or like intellectual signaling and I mean, Infinite Jest is absolutely up there too, right? Like, there's it's almost impossible to say that you have read Infinite Jest without coming off as a little bit of an asshole, right? <laughs> because <laughs> it's like nobody, nobody's ever like, oh yeah, I read it too. It's super fun. They're like, oh, <laughs> I also read Infinite Jest, right? <laughs> Did you catch the themes of, you know, this, this, and that? <laughs> yeah. What do you think was going on with the Wraith, right? Like, it's there's no. You know, like Game of Thrones is like a quasi challenging TV show, but everyone can enjoy it, right? Like, if somebody told me they like loved Infinite Chess the whole way through, I'd be like, "You're so full of shit." Like, I'm sure there's somebody out there, but it's not one of those books, right? It's not, and even the blog post that like, so like, I would say it's probably one of the best works of fiction I've ever read, and I can't tell you why, and I can't tell you I enjoyed it even halfway through. Yeah, that's that's a really good way of putting it. It's one of the most incredible books I've ever read that I never, ever want to read again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's okay, it's one of those things where I'm going to just compare it to like beer, for example. It's like, mm-hmm. if you're going for a beer that you will like, it's probably not going to be one of the experimental ones. Like there's all these, like there's a ton of really cool experimental beers out there. They're never going to be popular and they shouldn't be. Like they're not, like they're not going to be for everyone. But somebody who's in that space or who you know, homebrews or just as into beer might taste them and be like, wow, I can't believe they used, you know, bee pollen in this one and it actually tastes good or, you know, whatever it might be, or they use this type of yeast that 
you know, is more of a kombucha scoby as opposed to a, you know, regular beer yeast. Like there's things that you can appreciate from a technical standpoint and be like, wow, that's fucking amazing. But then there's like, you may still at a different point in time be like, I'm on a beach right now. I just want a Corona. Yeah. I don't want that like scoby beer, <laughs> you know? No, that that's a good way of putting it. Like you, you read it, I think for the experience of suffering through it, right? It's like, I guess horror movies are a little analogous to this, right? Mm, Where yeah. you don't, you know, strictly speaking, enjoy a horror movie while it's happening, but you enjoy having endured it and coming out the other side, right? Yep, that's a good one. And I, I, I'll be honest too. I think the thing I enjoy most about the book is like reading the theories about it afterwards. <laughs> like, yeah, it's been very fun digging into all the analysis and. I can see how it would be fun to read this in like a liberal arts classroom and then argue about stuff for a couple of weeks afterwards. Yeah, exactly. And I wonder, um, so I'm going to be really curious if like people listen to this episode and are like, Oh, I want to go take that on. Yeah. Or if we'll discourage people from reading it. Cause I, I, I don't know about you. Like when I originally tweeted that I'd finished the book, like this was month, I mean, maybe like five months ago now or something. I remember a bunch of people saying like, Oh, I started it and I quit or, you know, I'm, I've been in the middle of it for like 12 months, <laughs> things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, I wonder if this episode is going to be encouraging or discouraging. I get the sense it's going to be encouraging just because there's a lot of things we talked about that I think, and especially with the reading guide, like it could be a lot of people didn't know about that reading guide in particular. Because mm-hmm. I, without it, I, if we didn't have this episode and if I didn't have the reading guide, I don't think I would have even gotten to finishing the book. Like, I think I would have given up. <laughs> yeah i i would have too like yeah. the the forcing function of knowing we had set this date and we're going to record it and i pushed it back once and you know like earlier this week i was like uh should we push it again and i was just like no i'm just gonna like <laughs> read for three four hours a day yeah that's why i texted you yeah yeah you texted me on tuesday giving me an out and i was like no <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was also nervous about giving you an out because i was like if he hasn't if he's still a bit far away, then he's just going to like do another out. And I was like, that's okay. It's fine. Um, because we're not doing like our same weekly uh, recording schedule anymore. But that was nice that you didn't give yourself the out. And you're just like, no, I'm going to finish this. Well, and the, the funny thing too is to your point earlier about reading it in long chunks was that having to read the last like 20% of it in the last week yep. was actually really good. Yep. Because it forced me to read it in very long chunks every morning. And I wish I had read the first part of it that way too. So that was one thing when you said the rereading part, I don't think I would reread the whole book, at least not anytime in the near or even possibly distant future. <laughs> but I don't I think I would reread the beginning because like as I said, I was doing it in short spurts uh before. I, I did go back and reread the first chapter, but even like probably until maybe 300 or so pages in, I was going very slow and 10 pages here, you know, five pages here and and just really relying on the reading guide. And I wonder now going back, if I read those in large chunks and also kind of knowing some of the things you find out later, uh, I wonder if that would change the whole experience of those early chapters. Yeah, I I do want to go back and reread the first chapter because in many ways that is like, that's at least the chronological end of the book. So... It'd be nice to get a refresher on that. Yeah. Yeah. I look, uh, uh, David Perel uh, responded on Twitter when I said I finished it. And he was like, was it worth it? Mm. And <laughs> it's a good question. I, I'm like, I'm still struggling with that question a bit. Right. Because it's, it's like the short, my short answer is no, that there are a lot of ways you can find like a good mystery or thing to grapple with that I think you would like get higher utility out of. But then. Like when I think about it more, I'm like still kind of glad we did it. Right. right? <laughs> like, and, and I'll be 100% honest. I'm sure that that is, there is a non zero part of that that is just the, the accomplishment. <laughs> yeah. I like feel special. Right. <laughs> We're both part of the Infinite Jest Readers Club now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We can go like hang out at the Harvard Club and sip cocktails and, you know, talk about DFW now. Right. A great cynical view is, uh, probably DFW is like rolling in his grave right now or whatever. But <laughs> um, when I when I'm about to say this, a great cynical view is, I mean, he was a very smart guy. What if he realized that this is a book that now is this is definitely too cynical. So this is not my actual view. Just big disclaimer there. 
Uh, but he realized that this would be a book that's better to have, like you, it's one that you want to be able to tell people you have read or at least have on your bookshelf. Cause it looks like you're a very yeah. smart, intellectual human being. Um, and that that would sell a lot of copies. <laughs> well, I, I, a less cynical version of that, that I do buy into for a certain extent is that he in part wrote it to prove just how smart and how good of a writer he was. Right. Definitely. That was, that's for sure. Yeah, and I think that's we can say that the same thing for James Joyce, right? Where <laughs> it's like you don't write a book like this because you want to write a good book, right? Like you write a book like this because you want to prove something, I think. Oh yeah. You can see that with a lot of films too that try to be like overly cute or technical or artistic. Yeah, that's a good point. Where you kind of see like the that I mean you see it more in books, I would say, but where uh I guess the author gets like enamored with their own skill and right profi- and yeah like how smart they are i was gonna say we can contrast that with go to lesher bach yes because that never felt like hofstadter was trying to prove anything and it felt like it was the simplest way such a complex thing could be written and it was just like fun to read as challenging as it was at parts yeah but like it, it didn't really feel like he was you know stroking his writing dick for lack of a better way of putting it (laughs) (laughs) you see that with some uh some designers as well like uh yeah i think ryan has talked about this on twitter about just like sometimes like the design is just way too involved and has nothing to do with what the customer or user is like going to use it for it's just more for the designer to look like they're a good designer the designer wants to show off, so they design something that's like less effective than a... And that other designers will be impressed by. Yeah. Well, the, this is another thing I've noticed, too, with working with designers sometimes, is that they will change things that do not need to be changed as like oh, a way to justify their existence sometimes. And I think, I think everyone does this in every industry, but... I was just going to say, yeah, that's probably true for everybody. But yeah, I think yeah. like it's probably true for like, I was thinking even for... Like I was thinking for directors, right? There's only like a handful of like top directors Mm -hmm. and they're probably, they probably care after a certain level. Like if they've got like, let's say Tarantino or Scorsese, for example, right? Like they've had enough good movies and they have enough money that it's not like about money. It's, it's more about, oh, I want to make sure the other directors are like, wow, I can't believe he did that. Or, you know, I can't believe he made that decision in that movie, right? You know, it's like more about impressing your peers uh, after a certain level. Probably we all do this to to an extent. We could probably say something like this about Kanye, right? Yeah. Where he could have kept doing college dropout, late registration style hip hop, but it seems like he's felt the need to challenge himself with something new with each album since the first three. That's a really good point. And that, that's probably actually a healthier example of it because that's almost like he's playing against himself, I think. Right. Right. It's like... I can release, you know, can I release a song where I just talk about poop for two minutes and still have people love it, right? And it's like, oh, I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he's playing more of an infinite game. And actually, uh, if you haven't listened to it, we have a whole episode on the college dropout. Yeah, that was a fun episode. Yeah, that was a great one. We still got to do our movie episode. Oh, yeah. The Matrix. Yeah, Matrix would be solid. Matrix would be a good one. Yep. And it's got a lot of themes that we've talked about. Yeah, I wonder if... We really couldn't do Primer. I would love to do Primer, but... Is Primer the one you told me about last episode? Yeah, it's it's the one I always mention. It's the time travel one. Oh, yes. I still, and I still need to watch it. So thank you for reminding me one more time. It's like an hour and 20 minutes. You can do it in an afternoon. It's short. You can do it quicker than you can listen to this podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot faster than Infinite Jest. Yeah, that's for sure. Infinite Jest, I, I actually am glad I didn't time or like the Kindle doesn't. Does the Kindle keep track of how many hours you spent on a book? No, somebody somebody asked me how long it took to read it. And I was like, damn, I really wish Kindle had those stats. Because <laughs> it was it was one of those books where like Kindle's reading estimate is not that accurate. No. And so I would get to a point and I would, you know, check the thing on the bottom for the estimate. And it'd be like, oh, an hour and a half remaining in the book. And I'd be like, awesome. And then it'd read for an hour and it'd be like an hour and 20 minutes remaining in the book. And I'm like, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how it does those estimates. Because like there's, so, it can't be based on the number of pages, right? Because some books are so much quicker than than others just in terms of the prose. No, I've got no idea how they do it. It's like, but it's not very accurate. No, it's definitely not. It's kind of like Uber's estimate <laughs> Yeah. as well. It's like driver arriving in five minutes. It's aspirational. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think also, I don't know about you, for the Kindle, sometimes I just leave it open. Oh, yeah, I'm like making tea or something. Exactly, yes. Or I just like give up for a little bit or I'll have to Google something or whatever or not Google or like go into the other book and or I'll just like leave it open and check my phone. That definitely happened in the early stages of the book for me. Yeah. Where I just like couldn't stay focused in the first 200 pages or so. I think part part of it too is like he does open the book very abruptly. Like that scene, the, as we were talking about it, I was just like, that is a very strange. Yeah. It makes sense after you've read the whole book. But it's not a good hook to get you to read the rest of the book. Yeah. And it's like funny, but also absurd and confusing. And you're I mean, the the whole book is kind of like this. It's this chaotic stasis. You're just dropped into the middle of something that doesn't resolve. That is kind of absurd. And you have no idea where you are. And you're just like trying to figure it out. And by the time you get close to getting a sense of what's going on, that subchapter is over and you're on to another adventure. Right. I wonder if he took psychedelics. Dude, he either took more psychedelics than Joe Rogan or his <laughs> brain is so strange that he never needed them. Like, yeah, those are the only two options. Yep. I agree with both of those options. <laughs> it, could, <laughs> it could be both also. <laughs> it could be both. Yeah. Also, the number of drug references in the book, it makes I mean, he definitely I'm 100 percent sure he took LSD or something like that. Yeah. Maybe mushrooms. Well, and that's that's the other thing reading the book is. It would have been different reading the book before he killed himself. That's a good point, too. Like, because you really can't get that out of your head as you're reading these really brutal descriptions of addiction, right? It's like just the intensity and the power he's describing some of these cravings or these like self flagellations for trying to resist giving in and all of it. Like, it really makes you uncomfortable and it's very real and right. it's very clear that there are things that he himself experienced. Right. Like he's not writing them about someone else like experiencing those. It's clearly thoughts that he's had uh, yeah. himself. And so, yeah, you're right. It's different now that you know how his story kind of ends. Mm-hmm. It's definitely different. But I wonder before. Yeah. Because I mean, I when did you first hear the book? Like for me, it was probably sometime in college. Yeah. Sometime in college. I can't remember. Yeah. How far did you make it? You said you tried twice. How far did you make it each of those times? I think like once I made it to 10%, once I made it to 30%. Wow, 30%? I know. Without the guide? Without the guide. But I don't think I had any idea what was going on. <laughs> like, I think somebody told me this about them having to read Ulysses. They were like, I read every word, but I have no idea what happened, right? <laughs> it's like, there's a difference between reading and reading. Right. That's a great point. So I'd say, yeah, the first two times I definitely like read the words, but had no idea what was going on. Yeah, I could see that. Without the guide, I, I think that's exactly where I would have been. I would have been like, yeah. you'd, you'd have said, how far in are you? I'd be like, oh, 30%, but I don't think I could talk about this at all because I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Especially in the first half. It, it gets a lot tamer as it goes on, but the beginning right. is just so all over the place. And you have you have no character arcs yet. So like you don't have any idea how this stuff fits together. Or the dates. You don't even know the time. To- that threw me off the most. Yeah, you don't even know the dates. Like what t- I don't not only don't know what's happening, I don't know when we are in the plot. I don't know like where we are because like the country name is different, right? Like Yeah. They have like the great concavity and convexity, and that's like the garbage patch area. <laughs> And he's using acronyms and like doesn't explain them right away. So were there an end note somewhere? But they like they take a while to come up sometimes. So they'll like reference something, you know, O N A N, which is the new like unified North America, but you don't like find that out right away. Right. And I think like, let's see. Yeah, so the name of the first chapter is Year of Glad. Like Glad Rap. And your first reaction just has to be like what like what is year of glad right <laughs> <laughs> what are they talking about yeah because there's no context of like the subsidized time yet or anything like that nope man we managed to do a two-hour podcast on infinite jest and you guys managed to listen to it you guys managed to listen to it those of you who are left we, we <laughs> applaud you <laughs> you can be part of the i listen to a podcast on infinite jest club hey it's step one yep all right this was a fun one this was fun i i enjoyed this i kind of you know what here's an do you want to do a second episode where we talk, where we like really spoil stuff? Oh, like get really into the plot? Yeah, like get really into the plot and what might have happened. Ooh, like after, like that in between time. All the all the like speculative theories and 
that would be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Like we could go like dig into all the blog posts and stuff and then do another shorter episode in a week. Dude, that sounds awesome. Yeah. And we can label them like Infinite Jest 1, like minor spoilers, Infinite Jest 2, like full spoilers. I am 100% down for that. That sounds really fun. I bet that'll be shorter. I think that'll probably be like 45 minutes or so or an hour. Yeah. Because I want to talk about it with you anyway. And I know that we won't like find a good excuse to pencil in time to do that unless we schedule a recording. So. This sounds awesome. Yeah, let's do this. And also, I feel like people might want to li- like if there are people who have read the book, which I'm sure there are some or who will, they would find that episode really interesting. Yeah. Or people who are like, you know what, I'm just never going to read it, but I want to hear what they're talking about. Like they might enjoy it as well. I'll send you ahead of time. I'll, I was I started making notes on like all these because I didn't know how deep we wanted to get into like plot and spoilers and stuff. I made some notes of things from the blog posts that were really interesting that were purely plot related. Cool. So we can use that. And I'm sure you probably have other points also in there. All right, let's do it. But for now, we're going to wrap up another lovely episode of Made You Think. If you enjoyed this episode, we would very much appreciate it if you left a review on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever podcasts are sold near you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if uh, you want to talk to Neil or I, you can find us on Twitter, Neil or me. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Nat Eliason, N-A-T-E-L-I-A-S-O-N. I'm at the real Neil S. Uh, yeah, Twitter is probably the best way to get a hold of us. Um, but definitely tell your friends if you like the show. That's definitely the number one way, I, as far as I'm aware, that people hear about made you think. Yeah. And from what I, from what, I guess, what we can tell, you guys do like telling other people about it because we didn't record for months, and somehow more and more people heard of the show. So keep doing what you're doing, people. Yeah, we appreciate it. Uh, and if you want to know about other things related to the show, uh, we do have a newsletter at majorthingpodcast.com. It's very intermittent emails, but there are emails. So uh, you can check that out. And yeah, I think tune in next time for the, the spoiler heavy episode if you are so inclined. I think that'll be fun. I'm excited for that. Yeah. And we'll have in the show notes, we'll have all these. Um, well, we'll definitely have the, a link to the guide that we were talking about. Because if you, if you are going to attempt to read this book, Definitely use the guide. Yeah. Don't hate yourself that much. (laughs) Don't be a hero. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) You need the guide. Uh, So we'll definitely link to that one. Yeah. So I guess tune in next time for a whole bunch of spoilers and probably some tangents as well. (laughs) Yeah. It's going to be fun. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. All right. See you guys next time.